In the quest to understand and slow human aging, one of the most powerful interventions we've discovered lies right on our plates. In this video, Dr. David Sinclair, a leading researcher at Harvard Medical School, says that what and when we eat can dramatically influence our longevity pathways. The food choices we make don't just affect our daily health, they speak directly to our genes, activating or suppressing the very mechanisms that control aging. Recent breakthroughs in longevity science have revealed that certain dietary patterns can switch on our body's defense systems, potentially adding years of healthy life. Let me share with you the fascinating science behind how food choices can influence our biological age. Recent research has identified specific foods that stand out for their remarkable impact on longevity. Berries, cruciferous vegetables, nuts, olive oil, and fermented foods have emerged as powerful allies in our quest for healthy aging. These foods are central to the world's longest-lived populations, particularly in blue zones and Mediterranean regions, where people routinely live into their 90s and beyond in good health. What's particularly fascinating is how these dietary patterns, rich in plant diversity and natural compounds, consistently correlate with extended health span across different cultures and populations. When we look at the molecular level, some of the most powerful longevity-promoting compounds come from plants, particularly those that have experienced environmental stress. These stressed plants produce specific molecules that can activate our body's longevity pathways. Take berries and cruciferous vegetables, for instance. These foods are powerhouses of polyphenols and bioactive compounds like sulforaphane. Recent studies have shown these compounds can significantly reduce chronic inflammation, a key driver of aging. What's remarkable is how these plant compounds work at the cellular level, activating our body's natural repair mechanisms and protecting against oxidative stress. The deep colors in berries signal their rich antioxidant content while the bitter compounds in cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and kale are actually powerful longevity-promoting molecules. These findings highlight how natural compounds can support our longevity mechanisms. But mm. plants in particular that have been stressed out. So you can really? stress plants before you pick them. There's organic, of course, but you can pick the fruits and vegetables after they've faced adversity. A lot of light, not enough water, not enough nutrients. And there's a whole theory that we have behind that. But in general, how do you know a plant has these molecules that I'm talking about? The that, stressed out molecules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So plants need to survive just like we do. And those molecules, uh, they protect the animal and, and the plant. And when the plants get perceived adversity, let's take a, a grape vine, okay, that, that you know, make red wine out of. So let's take red wine. So that before you pick the grape, you typically, you dry out the vines, or you hope that there's not enough rain. And then the plants, the grapevine gets stressed out, um, not mentally stressed, but you know, it's fearful that it could die. So it starts making these, what are called polyphenols. Mm -hmm. And a phenol is just a ring of carbon with some hydrogens on it, and poly, obviously more. So this resveratrol is two carbon rings with some little eight OHs, oxygen and hydrogen. They make a ton of it. And it's bottled in red wine. And that's why, one of the reasons why you probably have some health benefits when you right. drink red wine, in moderation, right? Um, and when you take resveratrol as a supplement, it also has similar benefits. It's mm. found in clinical trials. Another fascinating aspect of longevity nutrition is understanding how our bodies respond to different levels of nutrients. The way to think of it is that you can mimic adversity or abundance. Mm -hmm. And the abundance is the steak, and what I do is the adversity, which is not as much uh, protein. Interesting. And there are systems in the body that sense a slight deficiency of protein, or at least a lower level, and kick in the defenses. This protein sensing system, known as mTOR, is fascinating because it acts like a cellular nutrient sensor. When protein levels are lower, it triggers cellular repair mechanisms and autophagy, essentially cellular cleanup that's associated with longevity. We think make us live a long time, but you can go to abundance and you'll feel great, you look, can look great, you can build muscle a little bit more, not a lot more, but a little bit more. When people say that works for me, it's you know within a few years of time frame. I'm talking 50, 60, 70, 80 years, like you said. When it comes to dietary patterns and longevity, the science shows that consistency matters more than extreme approaches. What's particularly interesting is how our bodies respond to different eating patterns at the molecular level. There's a lot to be said about variety in biology. 
Speaking of biological variety, fermented foods play a crucial role in longevity through their impact on our gut microbiome. Recent research has shown that a diverse gut microbiome is strongly linked to healthy aging and longevity. Foods like yogurt, kimchi, and other fermented products provide beneficial bacteria that help maintain gut barrier function and reduce inflammation. Studies have found that people in long-lived populations consistently consume fermented foods as part of their traditional diets. These foods don't just provide probiotics, they also create postbiotics and other compounds that support our immune system and metabolic health. Uh, and in the case of resveratrol, when we gave resveratrol to the mice, not every day, but every other day, that was the best lifespan extension. Not giving it to them in abundant formats, but in every other day or Pulse sporadically, it. really? Yeah. So what happened to the mice when you gave it to them every day as opposed to every other day? Um, they didn't statistically live longer unless they had some other adversity, which in that case was a high fat diet. And then resveratrol worked really well to protect them and they lived longer. Wow, so a high fat diet and that supplement. Then if you're like a mouse, if you are a mouse, then you will do pretty well. That was benefiting them, got you. But for a human, how would that impact? Well, we, we don't actually know. There's been a number of studies. If you take a high dose, so I take a gram a day in, in a bit, tiny bit of yogurt every day. The bioavailability of resveratrol meaning how well our bodies can absorb and use it, is actually quite crucial to understand. And that's important. If you mix it with water, it won't, it'll sink to the bottom. It won't work. It won't be absorbed into the body. Really? So it needs to be, you can't just eat it, drink water, I mean, put it in a pill format and drink water. No, it's gotta be so that, in. that's a, re a real tip, is you gotta dissolve it in something, a, a yogurt or some olive oil, for it to get in. It doesn't dissolve in water and it won't like penetrate the system or what? Yeah, you just it'll flow like, straight through. It's, it's little crystal, crystal lumps. So a lot of these plant molecules, there's one called quercetin, physetin, resveratrol. A lot of the supplements you get, if you break open that capsule, and often they're yellow, or, mm -hmm. and you put it in water and it doesn't dissolve, it'll sink to the bottom in these crunchy little crystals, it's not gonna get absorbed. So if it dissolves in water, that's good. That's okay. Right. Okay, that's fine then. Some vitamins will, but most of this stuff from plants is, is gonna be just straight through the body. A little bit will get absorbed, but if you take it with yogurt, or some food, we actually know you get five times the levels. So you can take it with food as well and it'll dissolve better, it'll digest yeah. better? Right. Gotcha, interesting. Okay, so these are a few things you mentioned. Eat less often, you didn't say eat less. You said eat less often. So you can still eat less often but pack it in the meal? Well, that's what I do. I have a big dinner and I really enjoy it now because I'm not eating much during the day. Uh, and it, it comes from a study, and actually it's important, that when I'm not talking about malnutrition, Certainly not talking about starvation. So, you know, if you're a teenage kid, you know, this is not for you. It's kind of people in their late right. th late 20s, 30s at least. But you don't want to have a calorie deficit unless you, you regard yourself as being obese or your doctor recommends it. Uh, I have to maintain my weight, which yeah, I do eat pretty more easily. Calories. Yeah. yeah, so I eat a pretty big dinner and it's great. Multiple courses. I don't eat dessert though. Mm -hmm. I gave up sugar when I was 40. Really? And do not regret that at all. What have been the biggest benefits of 12 years, no sugar? Surprisingly more energy, actually. Mm. Um, this combination of the plant-based, one main meal a day and no sugar, I feel so much better. I power through the day and I measure my blood glucose levels uh, on occasion. Uh, but yeah, you, you wanna have this period of about 18 hours at least to let your body uh, produce its own blood sugar. Mm. And so your blood sugar actually comes from your liver. It's called a process, uh, gluconeogenesis. This metabolic shift triggers several key longevity mechanisms in our bodies. When we fast, we activate autophagy, our cellular cleanup system that removes damaged components and reduces inflammation. This process, along with balanced blood sugar, helps maintain a healthy gut microbiome. Research shows that time-restricted eating patterns combined with minimizing ultra-processed foods can optimize these longevity pathways. The timing of our meals is just as important as what we eat. This fasting period gives our bodies a chance to repair and rejuvenate at the cellular level. What I saw in my blood levels when I was measuring it, and I do this maybe every month, is uh, contrasted to what somebody who eats three meals a day, it's super steady. I have this green line across here and it's wiggling here and then I have dinner, it goes up a little bit, but never out of this zone unless I eat a chocolate or something. With and the blood sugar levels is what you're saying, right? Glucose levels, glucose yeah. Glucose levels. Yeah. 
And so it goes up a little bit when you have dinner, but it's steady throughout the day. For me. For you. Because I've trained my liver to do that. To produce, produce it at that level. Well, it's really smart. It knows what I need and I power through the day. So I feel so good. I never get the brain fog. I never feel hungry. Well, not, not very. And I certainly don't have that, oh, I'm caffeinated, got a jitters nice. kind of thing. And that's because it's steady. Um, and I've measured myself eating three meals a day. And this is what happens. This is a typical person. Breakfast, huge spike. Above, it goes up uh, 150, 200 units. Uh, and then you'll feel good for a while. And then three hours later, it's called postprandial, your body puts out a ton of insulin through pancreas and it'll shoot down, try and pulling the glucose out of your bloodstream into your tissues, but it'll overshoot. The body just now goes down. So I'm here, an average person goes up here, down there, and now I can tell, now I'm hungry, I can't think, I need a snack, right? and it's down here. And then what do I do? I go and have lunch or a snack. It's back up here again. Mm -hmm. And then that's happening three times a day for most people. And that's the problem. You know, If you just want to not worry about food and be have a lot of energy and think really clearly, you want that. This blood glucose roller coaster is exactly what we want to avoid for optimal aging and cognitive function. By adopting a time-restricted eating pattern and reducing meal frequency, we can train our bodies to maintain steady glucose levels naturally. This not only supports metabolic health, but also activates longevity pathways that may help slow biological aging. The key is consistency giving your body predictable periods of fasting that allow these beneficial metabolic adaptations to take place. So what are the key takeaways for optimizing your diet for longevity? First, prioritize plant diversity. Aim for a colorful plate with plenty of berries, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and kale, nuts, and olive oil. These foods are staples in the Mediterranean diet and blue zones, where people consistently live the longest, healthiest lives. Second, include fermented foods like yogurt, kimchi, or sauerkraut regularly to support your gut microbiome. Third, practice time-restricted eating by limiting your eating window to six to eight hours when possible. And finally, minimize ultra-processed foods while focusing on whole, nutrient-dense options. Remember, these aren't strict rules, but rather patterns that have been consistently linked to healthy aging across cultures and scientific studies.